Welcome to Italics, television for the Italian-American experience. I'm your host, Anthony Tamburri. On this episode of Italics, we'll take you to the Guggenheim Museum for a look at the works of the Italian futurists. We'll talk with Vivian Green, curator of Italian Futurism, 1909 to 1944, Reconstructing the Universe, on view through September 1st. We'll take our seats in Di Capo Opera's theater for a talk with actress Yaya Forte in From Italy to perform Paolo Sorrentino's Tutti hanno ragione, Everybody's Right, as part of In Scena, Italian theater festival in New York. We'll talk with the Calandria Institute's Dr. Joseph Sciorra about the Institute's publication, The Italian American Review, and we'll bring you highlights of events celebrating the diaspora. Baseball great Mike Piazza lights the Empire State Building red, white, and green to mark the National Italian American Foundation's dedication to education. And the annual conference of the New York Conference of Italian American State Legislators honors Tony Danza and Liberty De Vito, joined by Governor Andrew Cuomo. We had stayed up all night, my friends and I, under hanging mosque lamps with domes of filigreed brass, domes starred like our spirits, shining like them with the prisoned radiance of electric hearts. For hours we had trampled our atavistic ennui into rich oriental rugs, arguing up to the last confines of logic and blackening many reams of paper with our frenzied scribbling. Thus begins F.T. Marinetti's description of the founding of the Futures Movement in 1909 which included in its manifesto items like, We intend to sing the love of danger, the habit of energy and fearlessness. And amidst its exaltation of the beauty of speed, included declarations that, We will glorify war, the world's only hygiene, militarism, patriotism, the destructive gesture of freedom bringers, beautiful ideas worth dying for, and scorn for women. We will destroy the museums, libraries, academies of every kind. We will fight moralism, feminism, every opportunistic or utilitarian cowardice. Despite its exclamation, museums, cemeteries, the works of futurism's artists have been given much consideration by some of the world's most revered institutions. The Solomon R. Guggenheim Museum in New York is the most recent addition to that roster, housing the first comprehensive overview of Italian futurism to be presented in the United States. The exhibit takes a look at the scope of futurism, from its inception with Marinetti's Manifesto through its demise at the end of World War II. The Guggenheim's Vivian Green, senior curator of 19th and early 20th century art and organizer of Reconstructing the Universe, sat with Italics to talk about the exhibit and the futurist movement. Why Italian futurism in New York? We realize that, in fact, in all of the United States, there had not been an exhibition that looked at all of Italian futurism, the full span of the movement, not just the teens, but the 20s and the 30s, and also all the different mediums in which the futurists work, because that is one of the ways in which they are an avant-garde in a way that no other avant-garde had proposed to be. It's very programmatic, you know, teacups, posters, advertising, photography, design, not just a painting. People would think, okay, futurism, painting, maybe a few statues here and there and that's exactly. it. But we have a whole literary movement that goes along with it. There's a whole sort of ceramic, or more than ceramic, yeah. but culinary utensils, clothing. The title of the exhibition, in fact, is Italian Futurism 1909 to 1944, subtitle Reconstructing the Universe. and that title comes from a manifesto that one of the first generation futurists, Giacomo Balla, writes along with the second generation futurist, Fortunato de Pero, and it really is about making the whole world over futurist. That's one of the sort of ideas, the leitmotifs of our exhibition, but it also is the beginning of a concept of the casa d'arte, these sort of artisanal art houses where different artists made things for the home. In fact, that was one of the great challenges of the show was how to take 400 objects and 80 artists and 35 years of production and organize it in a way that made sense 
and explain the really complicated history that goes with it. And you know, is he fascist? Is he not fascist? I mean, you you know, you learn to take a lot of things in a case by case basis. But even just to give context, what's happening on a historical timeline? Because if you don't have a European education, you're probably not going to know what was going in, in Italy between the wars. It's just not taught in school. So we felt we had to do step one and give a really clear overview of Italian futurism to an American audience which may or may not be familiar with the movement. And in fact, there is a really nice catalog. Why don't you tell us a little bit about the catalog? We're very proud of the catalog. It's uh, over 350 pages. It has over 325 illustrations and 30 essays. It has three longer introductory essays on art history, on history and historiography, because we discovered that there was no one essay in English that gave a really good overview of Italian futurism. And so you can just read about De Pero and theater, for example, or aerial ceramics, or Rosa Rosa, one of the futurist mm -hmm. women writers and illustrators. And that's there for for the specialist and for just an amateur who doesn't really want to read a long essay, but it's really interested in this one particular aspect of yeah. futurism because it's such a broad movement. So if you're going to teach a class on historical avant-garde and your students don't all read Italian, what can you assign? That and so now there we have we do we have the text. Some people do speak in terms of two futurisms, right? And De Pedro for some is sort of a marker either of the ending or the beginning. There is a school of thought that really only considers true futurism to be the futurism of the first generation of artists and writers uh, who start with the founding and futurist manifesto that Marinetti writes so starting in 1909 and it stops with either the onset of World War I and 14, Italy's entry into World War I and 15, or Umberto Boccioni, one of the main figures of first futurism's death in 16 it's by falling off right. a horse. And that allows you to very comfortably avoid any associations with fascism, or even before there's fascism in the late teens, just any turn to the right that might happen, because it's so hard for us to think about an avant-garde being right-wing and not left-wing, and yet, with the futurists, it does happen. But what that does, in my opinion, and I think in other scholars' opinions, is it sort of cuts the legs off futurism because, it, first of all, it gives you a very tiny window of work to look on. And also, you miss a lot of this kind of opera d'arte totale, Gesamtkunstwerk, uh, mm -hmm. you know, approach that, that becomes much better formed and fulfilled as you go forward in time. There's still a modernist purism to that first generation of futurism because they're not really doing things like advertising and I mean the manifesti kind of can be seen as that but in a very strategic very mm -hmm. highbrow way you don't have De Pero doing Campari ads right. but I think that's one of the fascinating things and of course again you know the real avant-garde knocks down those distinctions if you think about pop art or art right. today so looking back those seem like very modern conceptions and notions having been intellectually engaged in the movement from, from a literary point of view, you said 1913, 1914, it's La Cerba magazine, for example, yes, which exactly. really turns away from Marinetti and attacks them. And, and that brings up a very interesting question, which is there's futurismo and there's Marinettismo. Exactly. But it begs the question, <laughs> would futurism exist without Marinetti? Right. And I mean, not. I don't think no. it could. I think no. you'd still have a lot of these very interesting figures, but he really corralled and did something incredible. and whether you like him or not, you have to acknowledge it's quite an yeah. undertaking which he, in which he was incredibly successful. Yeah. And the other thing you mentioned, the advertising with the Pedro and company, but really Marinetti was doing that with the books back in 1910 and 11. He was putting in 20 and 30 pages yeah. of ads at the end Absolutely. of all the literary books. I mean, and he branded too. Exactly. Yeah. He gave things away for free. All the books had to look the same. The yeah. manifesti all have to look the same. Yeah. So you knew right away what it was. Yeah. But they're translated in lots of different languages. So yes. it's dissemination of ideas. I mean, again, and the exhibition puts a lot of emphasis on the literary and on ephemera. In fact, we have 70 pieces of ephemera, journals, books, manifestos, and so forth, because it was a literary movement first, and there were more writers than artists, in truth. It's, it's also easier to be a writer, I yes. think. I mean, cheaper. cheaper. <laughs> there were more women who were writers yeah. because of it's, you know, some people write at home, the child's taking a nap. I mean, in a time where we think of futurists as being anti-woman and women not being able to do that much in the arts or culturally unless they're very uh, privileged. In fact, you have a lot of women writers. Marinetti's own wife, Benedetta, 
already at a very young age is writing experimental novels and then also painting. She studies in Bala Studio. Rosa Rosa is another one who was an artist and illustrator and especially a writer. Let's spend a minute on the architecture because some of the architecture you see in the painting and then the so-called fascist architecture, which was built by Mussolini. Mm -hmm. Th there are some resemblances there. In terms of actual futurist architects, we have people like Santelia, Chiattone, right. later on Marchi, then Sartoris, who is more rational. In the case of the real architects, th th nothing they design ever gets built. It's just visionary architecture. And it's very modernist and very sleek, and it looks a lot like New York. I mean, they, and they were indeed. looking at images of New York, cutaway images of Grand Central yeah. Station. The idea of sort of trains being able to bisect buildings was very fascinating to them because you think of old Italian walled cities, you know, the train yes. stopped around the perimeter. And, it's and very <laughs> different. You don't cut through the right, Centro Storico. Exactly. What happens in the 30s, the architecture that gets built under fascism, which is when the big campaign occurs, the commissions go more to rationalist architectures, architects, people like Terragni. So it's actually the other side of the, okay. the modernist Italian coin, the kind of return to order mm -hmm. side, if you think of it as a Janus face. And in fact, the futurists struggle to try to get commissions in these buildings because Mussolini wasn't so fond of futurism. The only future, real futurist buildings that get done are temporary and they don't exist anymore. In fact, in the exhibition, um, in the last part on the ramp six, the top level, we have one section where we have a film about expositions from the 1930s, because there you see all these incredible pavilions, people like Enrico Prompolini designed, which are very cool looking and very different from the rationalist architecture. And we in fact built a model of a Depero pavilion that he made in the 20s. Um, made out of typography of letters for a bookselling company a called libro, Vestetti yes. Treves Tuminelli. Yes. BTT is the logo, and so the building is made out of those letters. And of course, that then gets destroyed at the end of the expo, but we wanted to recreate it like a one to three sort of ratio just to give people a sense of how modern they were mm -hmm. and, and how different it actually is from the more rationalist things we mm -hmm. associate uh, um, yeah. with, with fascism. There's also technology, right? The manifestos for aerodynamics and things of that yeah. sort. So the relationship technology is more a theoretical one. They loved the airplane by the 1930s. Mm -hmm. The whole idea of how transportation collapsed our definitions of time and space. Even with the metro, if you think about it, you get in one place and two minutes later you're somewhere across town. I mean, right. that was exciting. A lot of them became aviators or, or flew in planes in the 30s and the whole idea of the world seen from above was a very modernist idea because you see things in this very abstracted way. Again, your experience of space and time is even more modernized, if you will. Aviation is where the Italian military sunk all their money in the 30s because they wanted to be a military might in some way. You have people like Balbo who are doing his famous transatlantic flights. Right. He's, there's a street named after him in Chicago because there he flies indeed. to the Chicago <laughs> World's Fair in 33 with these hydroplanes yes. in formation. There's a lot of nationalist symbolism in the plane and there are a lot of images of planes circling over Rome, for example. So you see the Colosseum and you see up St. Peter's upside down and the Forum photographs as well where photographers would hang out of planes with a shutter open. But there, there's a lot of kind of fascist regime as a Roman Empire imagery going on too. There, there's, there's sort of coded propagandistic images, but, but incredibly interesting because it shows how, how these things all tied in together. What should an Italian-American take away from this exhibit? I've learned that a lot of people didn't really know that much about Italian futurism, and I think a lot of Italian-Americans, when they think of, and I mean, I'm half Italian and half American, so I, I count in a way. <laughs> when they think about their culture, or the culture from the Italian side, they think of the Romans and the Colosseum, you think of the Renaissance and the Baroque, you know, of Michelangelo or Bernini. and. There's nothing modern that you can reference. I mean, you, then the 20th century, I guess there's fashion and food, but that's yeah. sort of different, you know, yeah. or the unfortunate associations with the mafia, which right. unfortunately taint everything right. and are such a small part of yeah. what Italians are. I think to know that you have this incredible avant-garde that is part of modern culture and really has an important legacy today. What I did learn is the people who do know what futurism is in the United States are artists. Any artist you talk to knows no, Italian right. futurism, yeah. particularly if they do performance, but if they teach, they have the manifesto. Mm -hmm. So it's for artistic culture today, internationally, the futurists were huge. And I, I think that, you know, just to, to know that there's that legacy that's part of the modern age that, that belongs to our own culture is very important.
Italian Futurism, 1909 to 1944, Reconstructing the Universe, is on view at the Guggenheim Museum in New York through September 1st. In its second year, in Scena, Italian Theater Festival in New York, opened June 9th at the iconic Arthur Avenue Market in the Bronx, with special guest Yaya Forte, a leading actress in Paolo Sorrentino's Oscar winner, The Great Beauty. Italics correspondent Lucia Grillo met up with Miss Forte before her performance to talk about this play, which stands out in its relevance to the Italian perception of Italian Americans through a worldwide icon. Dici un po' di questo performance. È uno strano spettacolo perché io faccio un uomo, un cantante, un po' briaco, un po' strano. È la storia di questo cantante che viene a fare un concerto a New York, a Radio City Music Hall, uh, davanti a Sinatra. E canto anche delle canzoni napoletane nel, nello spettacolo che è stato scritto da Paolo Sorrentino, vincitore dell'Oscar con The Great Beauty. Con chi hai già un, un rapporto? Con cui ho fatto, sì, ho fatto appunto anch'io The Great Beauty ed è molto curioso, è scritto molto bene perché Sorrentino, oltre a essere un bravissimo regista, scrive anche benissimo e per me è una grande felicità essere a New York come Tony Pagoda, che è il protagonista del, dello show. Uh, also me, stay in New York uh, for play this uh, show. C'è un parallelo tra l'esperienza del personaggio e quello sì. tuo? Sì, song in Radio City Musical mm. e I play in the capo opera. <laughs> <laughs> e poi è un perfetto, um, uno spettacolo perfetto per in scena, dato che parla di un italiano, italiano che viene, che per viene a New York un per un italo americano sì. iconico. Gli italo americani sono molto citati perché lui viene a fare il concerto qui, incontra Sinatra, è tutta una storia in cui c'è molta relazione con gli italoamericani. Com'è che gli italiani pensano agli italoamericani? Con molto affetto naturalmente perché si pensa a delle persone che per mancanza di lavoro spesso sono emigrati per, e hanno dovuto lasciare la loro terra, quindi c'è una grande, c'è proprio un grande affetto gli italiani che vivono in Italia verso gli italoamericani e il sogno americano appartiene ancora a molti italiani l'idea che l'America eh, è un paese meritocratico e offre opportunità a chi si trasferisce agli italiani che vengono qui e tanti italiani hanno fatto fortuna in questa terra per cui c'è un grande amore per l'America e per gli italoamericani Qual è la tua sensazione di fare questa performance qui a New York? Beh, grande emozione perché io amo tantissimo New York e perché appunto la storia è un po' simile per cui c'è questo strano cortocircuito eh, essere qui davanti a un pubblico di italoamericani è una cosa che mi emoziona molto. Dopo di New York dove lo porterai questo spettacolo? Washington, poi a Detroit, per cui è una mini tournée americana e poi purtroppo ritorniamo in Italia. Io sogno di poter venire a New York e starci un periodo più lungo perché è una città che adoro. Mm. Uh, sono di origine napoletana mm. e di vecchia origine calabrese, ma poi ho vissuto molto a Napoli e New York mi ricorda moltissimo Napoli, c'è qualcosa che le rende molto simili e io mi sento molto a casa in, uh, in New York e I hope to come back. <laughs> We want you back. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Qual è l'importanza di un festival come in scena, l'importanza di portare teatro italiano qui a New York? Secondo me è molto importante perché è bello uh, anche per gli italoamericani conservare un rapporto con la propria origine, vedere drammaturgia italiana, spettacoli italiani, un modo per rimanere in contatto e per gli italiani un modo per allargare il pubblico e il, il rapporto con, con un pubblico diverso e quindi ben vengano manifestazioni di questo genere. Grazie molto. Grazie a te, grazie a tutti gli italici. The Italian American Review, a biannual peer-reviewed journal of the John D. Calandra Italian American Institute, publishes scholarly articles about the history and culture of Italian Americans, as well as other aspects of the Italian diaspora. The Calandra Institute is thrilled to announce the publication 
of Volume 4, Number 1 of the Italian American Review. Dr. Joseph Schorra, Director of Academic and Cultural Programs at the Calandra Institute, talks with italics and gives us some insight into the history of the Italian American Review, its history and scope. The Italian American Review is an academic journal that covers the social sciences and cultural studies. Mm -hmm. We've had a wide range of articles, everything from chain migration from the region of Umbria in Italy to the United States and other parts of the world to Anne Bancroft's film Fatso. We also have a number of reviews. Uh, we have book reviews of uh, current literature and documentary films. And we've been introducing in the past couple of issues uh, reviews of exhibitions um, throughout the United States and even in parts of uh, Canada. The Italian American Review has been in existence for a good number of years. It's been here at the Calandra Institute as its uh, academic journal and it was on hiatus for about five years and then when Dean Tamburi uh, started here we resurrected it and um, we are now in our fourth year and it's an exciting, it's an exciting endeavor because uh, the field of Italian American studies is really, uh, is really booming. The um, scholars are out there um, who are submitting articles. The books are being written, documentary films are being made, and the Italian American Review has, um, is becoming and has become this premier journal publication to highlight the incredible work that's being done in Italian American studies. The journal is an academic scholarly journal, but it can appeal to the general public who are educated and interested in Italian-American history and culture, um, or diaspora culture, because we do have works that go beyond the, the United States. Um, it's not a popular magazine. Um, there are serious articles in it. But this is, like our audience at the Calandra Institute, this publication is something that can appeal to a very wide audience who's interested in learning more about the diversity of the Italian-American experience um, in, in all its manifestations. It's a, sub, a subscription of only $20 a year. Um, for It's published twice a year. And it's a, it's a, it's a significant, um, it's a significant work that's really um, worth having in, in, in your home and in your office and in your library. To subscribe to the Italian American Review or to submit an article, visit the Calandra Institute website, qc.edu slash Calandra. Earlier this month, baseball legend Mike Piazza graced the Empire State Building for a symbolic ceremony that saw the New York landmark light up red, white, and green to mark the National Italian American Foundation's dedication to education. Italics was there to watch Mr. Piazza flip the switch. Here are some highlights. When you look up in the sky tonight and you see that tricolor, think of Italy, think of our community of 25 million, and think of the future generations that events like this will help to succeed and to become leaders here in Italy and all over the world. I'm very, very proud and grateful to be Italian American. This is a big day, not only for NIAF, but for Italian Americans, because usually it's only on Columbus Day that we get the tricolore. Sí. No, it's true, and, but I think it, as a greater whole, it's a, the celebration of the contributions of, of the Italians uh, to the United States and, and the celebration of their values and their work ethic and, and the fact that, um, you know, that, uh, that again, the, the faith that they've showed and, and the confidence and, and, the, and to, to get on, you know, a ship with nothing on your back and to come to a new country, a new land, and not only that, but to excel. Uh, in, in many, many fields, not only athletics, but in business and, and construction and other, and other, uh, and other industries. So it's, it's just a celebration. It's something that we're very proud to draw attention to and we want people to know and we want kids, the, the next generation, to celebrate as well. Tonight is celebrating the NIAF's mission and dedication to education. Right. How is that represented here this evening? It's represented through the supporters. Over the past 10 years, and this is our 10th year anniversary in New York, of um, joining together with the local real estate and construction industry and um, working with them for their support of the scholarship programs and helping NIAF 
the grant scholarships across the country. This is a big thing for NIAF, the, the, the lighting of the Empire State Building. This is fantastic. We've got uh, an iconic building. It's in the most beautiful three colors you could ask for. It's the day after La Festa de la Republica. You couldn't ask for better timing. And it really shows how, uh, I think, in, ingrained in this city our community is. So we're very proud. Each year, the New York Conference of Italian American State Legislators proclaims Italian American Day and honors outstanding members of the Italian American community. The 2014 annual conference celebrates actor Tony Danza and drummer Liberty DeVito. The event was accented by an appearance by Governor Andrew Cuomo and Mr. DeVito surprised the crowd with a rocking performance. Our conference made up of 45 members of the State Assembly and the Senate, a bipartisan conference that is committed to celebrating Italian history and culture. We provide scholarships, we have an annual festa, and our very competitive bocce tournament. Mr. Danza, we are very, very pleased to present you with the Italian American Individual Distinction Award for 2014. Thank you very much. Thank you for this award and the opportunity to speak to you today. Ti voglio molto bene, ci vediamo subito, e molto grazie. I play drums on New York State of Mind to honor the state I live in and love. Seen through an Italian restaurant which honors my heritage. We are a beautiful, artistic, honorable, uh, community-oriented people. We're Tony Danza uh, recently. We're Liberty DeVito. We are really people who are, are talented and skilled and who love community and love giving back. And that's a story that uh, we have to make sure we communicate also. And we communicate to our children so, their chil so they can communicate it to their children. And that's part of the message of today, along with celebrating the great actors and musicians and the, and the beautiful students, and most of all, enjoying the food. Enjoy. Grazie. <laughs> This is one of the events of the season here. Hundreds of people come out to help us celebrate Italian culture and history, and we feel very proud to be Italian Americans, but also to recognize those people who are distinguished themselves. It also helps us spread the message of diversity, that we're not the stereotypical image you see on television, that we are very, you know, play important roles in entertainment and politics and all fields of, of life. This is unbelievable. I, I, I can't believe it. It's so much fun, man. I've had a blast all day. You have a new band. Yeah, I have a new band called the Slim Kings. Yeah. Uh, I play with Billy J. Kramer. Uh, I play with a bunch of other people, guys from 38 Special, guys from Lyndon Skinner. We put bands together. We do a lot of corporate dates, things like that. Mm -hmm. And I'm involved in a thing called Little Kid Rock, which puts uh, instruments in the hands of kids in schools where the programs have been taken out. <laughs> Thank you for tuning in to this episode of Italics. Tune in to our next episode of Italics, airing July 30th. Watch previous editions of Italics on cuny.tv slash show slash italics and web extras on our Italics YouTube channel, Italics TV. I'm Anthony Tamburri. Arrivederci alla prossima puntata.